welcome our keynote speaker. Eric Raymond is a programmer, author, educator, and advocate for all things open source and Linux. My favorite description is that he is a wandering anthropologist and troublemaking philosopher. Among his many accomplishments as a writer is the book, The Art of Unix Programming, and of course the groundbreaking essay, The Cathedral and the Bazaar, which discusses free software development models. It also presents several axioms for creating good software, including, quote, every good work of software starts by scratching a developer's personal itch. And smart data structures and dumb code works a lot better than the other way around. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Eric Raymond. Thank you for inviting me to speak here today. Is the sound projection working properly? Can everyone hear me? Okay, well, I'll just speak louder then. There's a handheld mic you can also take. Oh, very good. Okay, hello? Is this thing on, he said, <laughs> uttering the classic cliche. Okay, it sounds like it is. Okay, uh, the title of my talk today is After the Open Source Revolution, and that's because I think it's, um, the open source revolution really started 10 years ago. And these days, uh, a lot of what we have to deal with are, are not the problems of still struggling to make that revolution happen, but the problems of having succeeded and having to deal with the aftermath. Not that the title necessarily means much, because I'm going to try and find out what it is that this audience wants to hear about from me and go there, wherever it is, regardless of what the ostensible title is. So um, feel free to try and get my attention and ask questions at any time. Don't be shy. Uh, don't be nervous. So um, after the open source revolution, so 1998 was a very heady time. We had the, the uh, open sourcing of uh, what became Mozilla and is now Firefox. We had uh, businesses waking up to the idea that, wow, maybe keeping things secret isn't such a good Minimax strategy after all. We had a lot of technical ferment on the open source front. And we had an early adoption phase of having to fight both technical and propaganda battles that I, I'd say lasted until, oh, roughly 2003. Uh, I would say 2003 is the point at which we became roughly uh, Roughly that year is the point at which we became part of the establishment. <laughs> uh, it became normal and expected for people to do open source things. So the question is, um, the, the success raises questions like, how do you institutionalize? How do you, um, how do you um, avoid becoming over-dependent on the charismatic leaders that got your revolution pushed through? How do you institutionalize? How do you scale up? How do you make your exciting, promising, pilot solutions into productive tools that people can use every day and not worry about or even really have to think about. Um, these are difficult problems and, and you know, I, I get exasperated with them sometimes. And when I get uh, so exasperated that I'm starting to feel like I, I could chew nails, it helps to remind myself that <clears throat> generally the problems of success are preferable to the problems of failure. You know, it could always be worse. We could always have failed. But uh, something I was, I was talking about with my friends on the way down here and, and some people before the talk uh, exemplifies the kind of challenge I'm talking about. Um, one of the things that went with the increasing success of the open source method 10 years ago was the development of a class of sites we, we call forges, or uh, open source hosting sites. The, uh, progenitor of this entire class of software was SourceForge, which many of you pro have probably heard of. These are sites where you can register a project, uh, associate developers with it, you get a, uh, you get a, a source code repository that people can uh, check out and check changes into over the net, you get uh, mailing list managers, you get bug trackers, you may get a, a bunch of other things. The idea is that these sites give you a zero administra administration collaborative platform uh, on which to do open source software, or any kind of software actually, although the ones I'm mostly interested in 
require that your project be under an open source license. And um, back in 1998, 1999, when that was first implemented, that was a really breakthrough concept. Uh, it's difficult to remember now, but I was reminded uh, a few days ago that back then, a lot of people weren't even really persuaded that version control systems were such a hot idea. I know somebody reminded me of this, and I, I found it kind of incomprehensible because I've been using those since 1992, and I, I viewed them as a valuable way to save me from my own carelessness. Uh, but the, the, the uh, version control systems were just getting established as a mainstream uh, uh, programming support technology then. Forge sites took it to a, a whole new level, and they were very exciting, and they tremendously amplified the, the potential productivity of the community around them. And now it's 10 years later, and let me tell you how I found this out, because it, it, brings, it, it throws a lot of these, these uh, how do you deal with success issues, into relief. <coughs> One of the projects I run is called GPSD. And it's a fun, fun project. It's a service team that, that monitors GPS sensors attached to a host computer, which is often, uh, for our users, a, a single board system and, uh, attached to a telemetry package in a weather station or a balloon or on an oil tanker or something. And um, the, the, the daemon interprets the reports that are coming back from the GPSs and presents them on a well-known internet port in a, in, a, uh, in a clean format. And it turns out that isn't as trivial as it sounds, mainly because the design of the reporting protocols from these sensors is god-awful. Oh, it's dreadful. The amount of black magic involved to get clean data out of them just, you know, it's almost beyond belief. But that's not what I'm here to talk about. So I have this GPSD project. It's been running since 2004. And uh, uh, back in 2004, I hosted it on a site in Germany called Berlioz. Uh, Berlioz.de, which it turns out is, is run by some obscure arm of the German government to facilitate open source projects. Um, and the reason I did that is because at the time, it was difficult to find a hosting site that would uh, allow you to use a technology which we all now take for granted, which is Subversion. Subversion, otherwise known as the first source code control system that didn't suck. <laughs> I, 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 I say this with deep feeling because I used source code control in the era when it sucked, and I remember what it was like. So uh, back in 2004, if we wanted Subversion, uh, Berlioz.de was basically the only place we could go that would support it, so I hosted my project there. And it's now 2009, and I have five years of history tied up in this website. Bug tracker state, source code repository, various other things. And, you know, it had occurred to me as a sort of a theoretical concern, I've got all this data in there, can I get it back out? But it was a theoretical concern, I had work to do. Then a bad thing happened. Uh, over a period of several months, uh, leading up to, I guess it was uh, mid-September, the performance of Berlioz was steadily degrading. More outages, more downtime, slower response. How does this tie into our larger issues? Well, um, Berlioz is being funded uh, by the German government and some universities which is nice, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a steady source of funding, but the way the institutional dynamics at places like that uh, work, it means that Berlioz is, has always been chronically understaffed. Not very many admins, uh, and um, they're not very well paid. Um, you know, these, these guys are not going out you know, paying gold-plated salaries for gold-plated expert admins. And this means that, especially at certain times of the year, um, around when Europeans have their vacation, um, service on Berlioz can get kind of flaky. This year, we had passed through the vacation period, which was in August, but performance had continued to degrade. And there came a weekend when I was, I was busily doing commits to GPSD, because I was in the process of doing a protocol design, a redesign, and that was huge fun, and I could talk for hours about that, but I'm not going to. And as I was doing commits on it, Subversion suddenly stopped working. I went, oops. And I looked at the website, and the website wasn't working. And I went to the administrative interface, and the administrative interface wasn't working. And I went, oops, this may be the final death of Berlioz. 
We've been making plans to migrate, but you know, it's like fixing the hole in the roof. You don't notice it when it's not raining, and when it's raining, you can't fix it. Uh, so the site went down. It looked like it was going to be permanent, and suddenly I was, I was faced with having to somehow recover the state of my project and move it somewhere else. And suddenly the fact that, um, that Berlioz was a data jail uh, became a really acute problem. Okay, back to the higher level topic, sustainability issues. Okay, uh, one of the things, one of the, the development patterns that we've all embraced in the open source community is using these hosting sites, which is great. But that means they've become critical infrastructure and we have to go <coughs> to the question of what happens when your critical infrastructure craps out. That's the kind of thing that I mean by problems of success. This is not the kind of difficulty that you have when you're a bunch of fist-pumping communards at the barricades, you know, <laughs> shouting down with the game. But after you win, you have to deal with stuff like this. You, and I could talk about this from another angle, uh, institutionalizing things like the Open Source Initiative, and maybe I'll get to that later in the talk if people are interested. But um, let's go back to our infrastructure issue here. So <clears throat> critical piece of infrastructure goes poof. Uh, and I, um, I spent 72 hours scrambling to reconstruct as much as I could. Fortunately, I had a subversion dump file that was complete up to about two weeks previously, and one of the lurkers on the project's IRC channel, important social fact that I'll highlight in a moment here, one of the lurkers on the project's IRC channel had been maintaining a mirror of the subversion repository in Git that I didn't know about. And when I went on the IRC channel and said, whoa, fear, fire, foes, flood, disaster, you know, pestilence, calamity, lawsuit, um, the, uh, well, no lawsuit, actually. Uh, he popped up and said, well, I've got a Git mirror. And I said, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, still left me with the problem of recovering a couple of other things, one of which was the mailing list archives. Wasn't too worried about that because I knew about Gmain and a couple of other places that routinely take um, uh, mailing list archives from, um, uh, from hosting sites and mirror them. <coughs> Are we seeing a theme developing here? The unofficial Git mirror that I didn't know about. Various mailing list uh, mirrors that I didn't know about. A theme when you're maintaining critical infrastructure is there has to be redundancy. And, uh, and, and at least as importantly, it has to be redundancy you can actually use and reconstruct your, 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 your project from later. So I wasn't worried about the mailing lists too much. I had the Git mirror and a fairly recent um, uh, repo file to reconstruct my project history from. Uh, the messy part was going to be the bug tracker. Because as far as I knew, the bug tra tracker state only existed on Berlioz itself and it wasn't replicated anywhere else. So um, now we're getting to the, uh, the, the, the next stage of looking at our failure mode analysis, which is that I decided this is not to be born. I need to do something about this. You know, I'm a hacker. I don't contemplate problems like this and go, oh, this is dreadful. Now I'll think about something else. I, I pile into them. I try to solve them. So what this pointed out as a problem to me was we need to have some way that a, that a hosting site user can pull bug tracker state out of one of these sites and keep a copy of it for backup and possibly to be migrated somewhere else later. So I started thinking about that problem. And in thinking about it, one of the things I did, and here we go, wonders of open source, hey, hey, I found the actual code bases for several of the major ho hosting sites, including Berlioz and, and, uh, and Savannah, which is the one that the Free Software Foundation runs for its projects and GNA.org, which is a, a very popular, very well-run host site. In, uh, it's run by FSF France. It's actually my favorite one of the existing sites. I looked at the code bases for all of them and actually got de developer privileges on that, uh, that's the name. And I discovered something else, which ties back to our theme of how, how you deal with success. The internal architecture of the Forge <coughs> systems that I could get access to was, without exception, a disaster. Horrible. Let me describe exactly how. Um, the standard Forge architecture, which everybody has inherited from SourceForge, uh, with 
a couple of marginal exceptions that don't have significant market share because nobody knows about them yet, works like this. You've got a database, which is maintained by SQL or something like that, and it's, it holds all the, uh, the, the state of the Forge site, including the, the bug tracker data from the projects and the developer permissions tables and all of that stuff. It doesn't hold the mailing list, those are usually stored separately. And then you've got a web front end, and the web front end is written in PHP and Perl, and it's got the SQL queries for the database embedded in it. Okay, I see from the lack of horrified gasps that there aren't many people here who understand how bad that is. The reason that's bad is because it means there's no separation whatsoever between the, 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 the superficialities of the web interface of the system and the way the database logic works. That means that has a, a number of bad consequences. One of which is you can't script the web system remotely except by tediously going through the web interfaces. Everything is an infinite clicky clicky dance. This is bad. And your scripting agent breaks whenever some site designer gets it into their head that they want to change the visual presentation of the HTML. That's bad too. So it means that in a world where forges consist of these, these ugly piles of PHP talking directly to SQL, I can't remote script the system. I can't build data extraction tools that work reliably across even trivial interface changes. And well, okay, those will stand as bad consequences that are representative of problems. So I looked at this and I said, this, I mean, this is dreadful, and the thing is that we didn't notice this when we were, when we were busily being in, you know, in, in uh, confrontative revolutionary mode, because the, whole, the SourceForge was such a breakthrough concept that we didn't notice that the architecture was complete crap. <laughs> but now, it's 10 years later, and we have infrastructure problems that are severe. We have serious brittleness, because it's so hard to get information out of these systems. And the fact that it's so hard to get in, out, information out of these systems ties directly back to the badness of the architecture, the, 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 the poor separation of function that I'm talking about. Okay, so why have I gone through this boring anecdote? Because I wanted to give a ground level view of what the problems of success look like. These are the problems of success. You have to deal not with the consequences of the problems you originally set out to solve, but with the consequences of your solutions. So, um, and any of you who are thinking about starting world-changing reform movements, well, you know, just be aware that you'll go through this at some point. This is what happens if you succeed. Um, so, I, I, in, in telling this anecdote, I intended to touch on several different issues which have to do with uh, coping with success. One of which is, one, an obvious one here is technical sustainability. We built, uh, in the original forges, built architectures which could really, which could do good things, but they weren't sustainable over the, lo the, wrong, the long haul in particular because they led to this kind of brittleness that I'm describing. I'm not sure I'm gonna solve, how I'm gonna solve this yet. I'm, I'm about to announce a project called Forge Plucker that's specifically intended to write tools to pull data out of all the different kinds of uh, forges and represent them in a common XML format. So at some point, there's some, some hope of doing cross-forge migration with importers. It's, you know, it's an interesting technical problem. There are also some serious political and deployment uh, challenges. And it's the kind of thing you have to do when you're coping with success. This is, you know, this is where it's at. This is what you have to do. Um, so there's, there was a, there's an issue of technical sustainability because the architecture of the original forges was so bad. There's also an issue of political and economic sustainability, which I touched on earlier when I said one of the reasons Berlioz have, has problems is because it's perpetually understaffed with administrators who are relative newbies. And as long as your infrastructure is dependent on institutions that are not for profit, that's going to continue to be chronically the case. As long as your, your infrastructure is being run by uh, nonprofits and volunteers, you're going to have that kind of problem, and the question is, how do you engineer to cope with it? Okay? I'm not just asking that question to let it dangle there. I'm going to propose an answer. 
if the individual components of your system are unreliable and that creates a, a sustainability problem, then you have to make migration easy and you have to make replication easy. You have to reduce the friction costs of cutting your dependence on a particular node of that system. Now, notice the second order effects of this. One of the things that I'm hoping to do with the Forge Plucker project is uh, light a fire under the Forge designers. The Forge world has been pretty stagnant for about 10 years now. Um, the, 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 the basic Forge design is still just as bad as Source Forge was in 1998. And you know, this is really damn frustrating to me because in 1998 when Source Forge was first being developed, I was actually a director at the company that launched it. I was on the board of directors of the company that launched it. <coughs> and I didn't know the project was such a mess, or I would have stepped in and, you know, and, and slapped people hard until it got improved. But I didn't know at the time. Missed opportunity. I assumed they were doing better work than it turned out they were doing. And, and you know, I, I, I don't mean to sound so negative because the, 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 the truth is, it really was a breakthrough for the time. But it, the breakthrough wasn't enough. And that brings us right back to the top of the agenda topic, which is the breakthrough isn't enough. You have to deal with afterwards. You have to deal with afterwards. And the coping strategies for dealing with afterwards have broad similarities, no matter what kind of infrastructure you're talking about. You have to, make, you, you, you have to do things to increase robustness. You have to do things to uh, decrease redundancy in the system, so one node going out um, doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, critically compromise you. And the point I'm getting back to is one of the things I hope to do with Forge Plucker is put, put pressure on the Forge designers. The world's been stagnant, and one of the reasons I think the world's been stagnant is because once you committed your project to a particular repository, you were locked in. They didn't have to do anything to keep you because the friction costs of moving a project were so high. Well, one of the things I intend to do is make the friction costs of moving a project really low. Now, what happens when you do that? Suddenly, the forge designers actually have to compete again. So, this is another and perhaps the most important uh, aspect of sustainability. If you want real sustainability, remember when I said non, the, the, the uh, low funding level of nonprofits and so forth is an issue? If you want real sustainability, you need something that looks like a market where people are competing. It may be competition for money or it may be com competition for attention or mind share. But unless there's something that has the dynamics of, of a competitive market, you don't have sustainability. Because the agents won't self-organize to do the right things. Um, so that uh, sort of brings me to the end of my pre-prepared -pre rant. I guess now I will take questions from the audience and see what direction this wants to go. Who's going to be the brave first person? Don't all step forward at once. <laughs> okay, Eric. Um, you say SourceForge was implemented very poorly. The architecture was really bad. Yeah. But it was a very new idea. Right. Now. It's a constant tension, I think, when you're starting moving into a new area between do it and design right. it. Do so, you think they got that wrong, or do you think that was inevitable? Uh, no, I think they got that wrong, because if I, if I had been designing, uh, implementing SourceForge back then, I know how I would have done it. Uh, and I would have done known then how to yes. do it. Yes. Yeah, I would have known how to do it. The key thing you need in a system like that is, an, is, is some kind of service broker that is separated from the interfaces. So that in particular you can have one interface that's a, that's a web thing and another interface that's a channel for email responder bots and XML. We didn't have XML RPC, but the principle is the same. You want, you want, you want to be able to separate the channels into the system from the core logic and they failed to do that. And that was clearly a bad idea entirely separate of what the, the, the actual implementation technologies were. Um, yeah, you mentioned that uh, you know, sometimes the political impacts impact the uh, success of the project. So where can I um, put this in my curriculum other than when I put the kids in their actual internships um, you know, and facing it for the first time there? I want them to get it ahead of time. Where do you put what? 
Wow. You know, I don't know if there are any good materials on this subject. Does anybody know the answers yet? Um, write them down in a book? Well, it's interesting. Gee, uh, who would that be? Uh, well, I wrote a book about this. I wrote a book about some of this 10 years ago. Uh, I didn't focus on the deployment and scalability challenges. But there's another book now that's addressing community building from that kind of perspective. Uh, and it's, I'm facing the title now, but it was written by a name that will be an easy Google search, Jono Bacon, J-O-N-O-B-A-C-O-N. Uh, I think it's called The Art of Community Building. Titled something like that. But if you Google for his name, you will, you will find a reference to it. He's not so, so much focused on the technical infrastructure aspect of it that I've been talking about, but uh, his book is all about building sustainable social infrastructures. And uh, I've only read about 50 pages of it so far, but it looks pretty sane, so that might be a good launching point. Next question. Yeah, I think that was the, the implied metaphor. Uh, as I said, a forage system is a system for collaboratively, for helping people collaborate on software projects by providing repositories, mailing lists, and communications tools. So forage is a more general... That's right. A, a, a forage system is, a, is, is... There are lots of different forage systems now. Most of them are evolutionary descendants of the original source forge, a few are not. Which, which would you recommend for an undergraduate uh, projects course? Which forge would I recommend using? Yes. Oh, uh, that's easy. Um, uh, GNA, the one the FSF hosts. Of all of them, GNA.org. GNA, org. G -N -A org. Of all the ones that are fielded and available now, that's the one that I have found most pleasant to use. I've been a developer for a couple of years on a project called Battle for Wesnoff that's hosted there, so I have a lot of experience. And recently I acquired admin privileges there, which makes me feel better about using it. I can go in and fix things. Um, now, the one caveat I have about Gnado.org, and it illustrates what I'm saying about the, the Forge world being kind of stagnant, is it works really well but evolutionarily, it's probably not going anywhere. Uh, the project hasn't had any commits, I should say hadn't had any commits in two years until I got commit privileges and fixed a typo in a Perl script. <laughs> so there's not a lot of development going on there. Now, uh, one of the consequences of me getting interested in this problem is one way or another, either I'm gonna solve it or a group that I'm enabling is gonna, so is gonna solve it. Uh, but you shouldn't count on anything um, really usable being delivered for, oh, I'd say a safe guess would be six, six months at the inside, a year to the outside. So it doesn't solve the right problem. It doesn't solve the problem right now, but we will get to it. Yeah. So this is more sort of cultural and economic. Uh, what do you think about the idea of uh, companies using crowdsourcing ideas to sort of pose challenges and offer a million dollar rewards to get software developed or algorithms developed to solve some of the hard issues. There's an easy way to predict whether crowdsourcing will work on a particular challenge. Uh, crowd, the effectiveness of crowdsourcing is directly proportional to the strength of the objective metrics for success that you have available. If you have strong objective metrics for success, things like the program runs or it doesn't, then crowdsourcing works extremely well because every, every, everybody can hone <coughs> in on that objective test and the behavior of the crowd tends to converge on something productive. If, on the other hand, there is no objective metric for success, you tend to get crowdsourcing uh, breaking up into a bunch of cliques that are mostly pursuing objectives that are irrelevant with energy that could be better expended elsewhere. So a good way to predict whether that will work is do they have an objective metric? Do they have a performance test that cranks out a measure of fitness that everyone can agree on? If that's the case, then crowdsourcing will work. Well, what about you know, offering million-dollar prizes that we've seen in the last couple of years to, to... That's, 
that can work fine, but it's orthogonal to the crowdsourcing issue, really. I mean, offering bounties for solutions has a long history. <coughs> yeah. A lot of effort has, in the open source community has been put on uh, very visible projects like internet browsers, operating systems, or in the case of niche products, often um, or niche applications, those applications that, that the developers themselves uh, that contribute to it are particularly passionate about, even though it may be a small niche market. Mm -hmm. What do you do about trying to encourage the open source community to support um, groups of users? And here I'm particularly thinking of assistive technology, where in fact the user base is often quite distinct from the programmer base. You suffer a lot and you mostly fail. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, that sounds really harsh, but it's the truth. Uh, it's not. Even if the developers out there are really well-intentioned about serving a, a group like that, they don't have the knowledge to do it. And making the connection between the people who have the knowledge and the people who have the ability to use it and embody it in code is a difficult process that's fraught with all kinds of social, social friction, social and technical friction. I'm not saying you shouldn't try, and I'm not saying that there won't be occasional successes uh, that will vindicate all the effort you, sh you should put in, but don't go in with high expectations. Yeah? Taking that thought a step further, does it mean that Linux can in principle not succeed for non-technical end users? Um, it depends on, that depends very much on whether a sufficiently large number of Linux programmers decide for themselves that they want to get clueful about UI. And it is still not clear whether that's going to happen fast enough. On the positive side, um, we are so much closer to that goal than we were in 1998. I mean, it's wonderful. The anecdote I like to tell, and it is only an anecdote, but for me it's an important one, is my octogenarian mother is a happy Linux user. Does she know it? Yes. <laughs> oh, good question. Yeah, well, she doesn't really care. I mean, she knows about the word Linux, and she knows I'm involved with it. But, I mean, I don't know what you mean by no, really. I hate to sound like Bill Clinton. But, uh, um, so, so, so the fact that, but, you know, all technicalities aside, uh, the fact that my octogenarian mother is now a happy Linux user says we've made immense strides because that certainly wouldn't have been possible 10 years ago. I'd say it wouldn't have really, even really have been possible as recently as five or six years ago. Uh, and Ubuntu made a lot of difference that way, both in what Ubuntu did in internally itself and in the fire that it lit under other distributions and other developers. So I think we can get to the point where Linux is routinely good enough for most non-technical end users, I don't think we're quite there yet. And I, and I sympathize with people who feel maddened by the gap. I have to say that your octogenarian mother might have better technical support than most people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you make a good point. But the truth is, uh, she's been using Linux for 14 months. And I've had to do exactly two service calls. And one of those was because of a hardware failure. So it, it is, you know, a lot of people assume when you tell a story like that, oh, yeah, and you're on the phone with her every weekend, you know, helping her out of jams. Really, it is the things I had to help her with were things about how to learn to use a browser, which would have been an issue regardless of operating system. And I can actually describe what my service calls were. Um, my mother, at one point, uh, she had gotten the idea that she should shut, shut her system off when she wasn't using it. It was one of the older systems that, uh, it was a scavenged older system that uh, didn't really have the motherboard capability for a soft shutdown. Uh, and I wasn't really worried about that because modern Linuxes, are, the file systems on modern Linuxes are pretty hardened against uh, instant shutdown. They've got journaling and they've got you know, half a dozen other forms of redundancy. And there's only you know, maybe a one in 400 chance that if you hit the power button, your file system's gonna get corrupted. <laughs> <laughs> my mother managed it. <laughs> that was one of my service calls. 
Uh, the other one was, I think I was troubleshooting some kind of problem with her, her wireless access. Um, and I, I, in fact, I can, yeah, in fact, I have never had to uh, teach her or troubleshoot stuff on, on things that were Linux specific. It's just never happened. So that's a good thing. It means, it means that for a large class of users who are primarily concerned with, with, uh, with internet browsing and email, uh, Linux really is a zero administration system, and that's the place that we need to be. Next question. Way back there, I think I see a hand. How many uh, Linux systems today do you think have GCC installed, including your mothers? Mm -hmm. Ha! Uh, you know, it, it's interesting that you mentioned that. It's interesting that you asked that question because now that you think, of, now that I think about it, I'm not sure my mother's system has GCC on it. And the reason I'm not sure is because I never compile anything on that system. I run the package manager in interface and I download and install packages. And that's a big change too. I mean, it used to be 10 years ago when we were still fighting the revolution, when you had to, when you had to build a package, you downloaded the source tarball and you ran configure and you ran make and you ran make install. That's actually pretty rare now. I mean, I still do that, but I only do that for projects on which I am an active developer and have to be working with, with sources that are beyond the level of the current binary package. But a big change and, a, and an important one for sustainability is that installation of new software is really easy. It has, it has in fact, become trivial. Next question. Yeah, another one back there. Um, in the environment, Software development in that open source sense. Is there are there things we can learn from that environment that can be ported to for paid kinds of jobs and sure. places like Microsoft? Yeah, don't keep secrets. Secrets suck. <laughs> Secrecy is the enemy of quality. Now, I say that for a very specific reason. Um, the thing that I figured out 10 years ago, and, and uh, 10 years experience has only reinforced it and from both my experience and many other people's experience, is that human beings are really good at building complex systems. You know, and, and I'm not just talking about um, 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 software here, I'm talking about things like suspension bridges too. Human beings are really good at building complex systems that have lots of errors in them. Errors in the kinds of complex systems created by human beings typically cannot be detected mechanically. There is no decision procedure that you can apply with a machine that says this is a bad suspension bridge design. There is no decision procedure you can apply to a software program that says this is a bad software design. Some of you know about this. It's called the halting problem. Okay. There is no me mechanical decision procedure that you can apply to creative human work as complex as suspension, and suspension bridges and software. That means that the only hedge we have against systemic failure in these complex systems is peer review by human eyeballs. If you keep secrets, you are cutting your own throat. That's the lesson of open source. Comment related to that. Uh, the Multics people learned that 40 years ago. Yep. By yep. making basically all their source code available, and they found security holes much quicker. It's very true. In fact, the first statement of uh, what I would uh, what I would now consider open source ideology was made by uh, Corbato, uh, Dr. Corbato, the design chief of the Multics project in 1965. And I don't remember the exact phrasing, but I can tell you that reading it now. Uh, nearly 50 years later, it still seems timely. Some, some things never get old. Next question. Oh, come on. I can't be boring everybody stiff this soon. Well, I'll ask. So, you know, if, if you had to inspire junior, senior computer science majors today to sort of participate in some of these ideas and projects and contribute, um, do you have a message for 
Yeah, um, I have a very practical message for them, which is participating in open source projects is a great way to build a portfolio that will impress an employer. In fact, um, there have been studies of the economics of open source that suggest that this is one of the major motivations for people to engage in these projects at all, as a signaling behavior about their capability. And there is some evidence that this does, in fact, translate into higher wages and better jobs when you wave that portfolio at somebody. So there's a very practical piece of advice. Participate. It's not just idealism. It helps you. Next. Do you think there is a change in the biggest secret keeper in the world? And, uh, for example, Cornflex? <laughs> no. Uh, the reason I'm skeptical about that is because um, Microsoft's project of profit margins are unsustainable without a monopoly position. Its monopoly position is unsustainable without a secrecy-centered business models, uh, model. If you can't sustain profit margins, you can't produce the, the, uh, the prospect of ever escalating growth in your stock price, which is what drives business strategy. Microsoft is trapped. It can't change. Because if it did, it would be cannibalizing its own business, and it would be, in effect, saying to investors, wow, we're going to have lots lower profit margins in the future. Isn't that wonderful? They can't change the trend. Notice that I said nothing about good or evil there. Next. Wow, am I exhausted every day? How much, how, how much longer do I have here? Um, oh, sorry. 20, 20 minutes anyway. Yeah? Okay. So, given that you have some students and you want to get them involved in participating in an open source project, how does one start? Um, a good way is there's a site called Freshmeet, freshmeet.net, which exists basically to retail to the world new projects announcements, uh, new project announcements, and release announcements on existing projects. A lot of projects, by no means all, when they put out a new release or when they, uh, when they, <clears throat> when they launch, they will submit a notice to Freshmeet, and then the, uh, the notice to Freshmeet includes, at a minimum, the name of the project, a short description of the project, and a link to the project's homepage. You can learn a great deal about what's going on in the open source world simply by logging into Freshmeet and watching the release announcements scroll by for a while. And the strategy I would recommend for a student that wants to get involved is to watch Fresh Meat until you see something that makes you go, oh, cool. That's the one you want to sign up for. Yes? Yeah, can you lend any insight to something that really bugs me? Um, and I'll give you two and a half examples. First, something that doesn't bug me. I, I use um, FileZilla, <laughs> which I think is a great free and I think open source, right? Uh, no, no, I, I'm okay. not familiar with it. I use it on a Windows platform just because that's what I have most of the time. And um, every week, two weeks, whatever, I don't remember what I have configured, a pop up will come and say there's a new version to download. Uh -huh. And you click on OK, and it downloads and installs automatically, and there it is, and it's fine. And, it doesn't change it dramatically. It looks and functions the same. So I like this. I like this. And it's free and I assume open source. Uh, then you get to things like, like Windows XP, which I thought was, for the platform, pretty solid. And then Vista comes along, which is not as good. No. <laughs> and, then, uh, and the same with, with uh, Office 2003 versus Office 2007 with the, with the, the ribbon interface that is supposed to make our lives easier. So why do we get software that works great and improvements are made and it still works great and then we get other businesses that, that completely destroy something that works great? Because they're in the business of selling software. It does, it does them no good if you keep the software you're using. Microsoft thinks, and it's probably right on some level, that its most serious source of competition is its own old versions. Remember what I said about they need perpetually rising uh, profit margins so they can sustain the illusion that their stock price will go up forever? 
One of the consequences of this is every year they have to turn over an increasing number of their old customers in order to, to, to sustain the cash flow to keep the shark moving. Okay? Uh, and that means that there's a, a strong business incentive built into the system to produce feature churn. That's the problem that you're talking about because if you feature churn your program at a constant rate, the higher that rate is, the more likely that you're going to introduce bugs or incompatibilities or UI problems, uh, especially for users who are comfortable with the old behavior, as what you're actually trying to do is add enough features that they'll be that, that they'll have an incentive to buy it again. But you know, sometimes that backfires. This is an, an inevitable product of the closed source treadmill. Note that open source, um, open source projects don't have this problem. Since they're not concerned with se selling you upgrades, they can settle on a stable, good interface design to keep it. And I give you as an example of a program that has done this really successfully, Firefox. You'll notice that Firefox's UI has changed very little since the first release came out. There's been a lot going on inside, for example, to permit it to interpret more file types and present them in interesting ways. There's more going on with book bookmarks than there used to be. But these were all very minor changes. The look and feel of Firefox has stayed pretty constant since it was first released. And this is because they got a UI design that was pretty good and they don't have any business incentive to engage in feature churn. Now, there is a failure mode of open source projects that's similar. Sometimes you get drastic redesigns that break a lot of, these, of, of stuff. But in the open source world, that happens because some architect guy gets a brilliant idea and decides he needs to reinvent the world so that his genitals will become larger or something. <laughs> uh, so that, that, that kind of motivation has a, has a similar effect to uh, business model driven feature churn, but it tends to be less severe and happen at less frequent intervals. Yes? Well, we're at the part of the day where we winter about our pet peeves. Uh, okay. I'd like to present an opposing opinion here about Firefox because um, it is free, it is open source, there isn't this profit um, motive. But what it does is it now does update in place, which means that whenever it gets updated, it removes my old version. Um, without asking me. Um, in fact, it doesn't even ask me whether I want to update. It presents a pop-up that says, the update has been downloaded, restart now to activate it, and my old version is gone. I, the, my choice has been taken away to look at a new version and decide whether I like it or and decide whether I want to go back to the old version because I like the old version better. It well, just decides for me that I'm going to use a new version now in, my old version has been removed before I even really noticed. So, so I may have a solution for you. The update strategy, and I wonder why. So I may, I may have a solution for you for that one. You want to look at the about colon page. There's, a, uh, there's a, an about page that gives you all the internal configuration variables of your Firefox. I bet if you look on there, you'll find one that can be used to disable the auto-updating or make it sure. Sure, but now it's, we're talking again about the, the geek user. Yeah. If, if you're talking about the broad user, um, they are now essentially... Right. The answer is for the users who are not geeks, the behavior you dislike is exactly the behavior they want. So why is that so different from, from Microsoft, where you just, just because they do it for the profit reason and Firefox doesn't... Well, I mean, but, uh, but when, when was the last time that a Firefox uh, upgrade actually broke your UI? Yeah, there's the, you see, that's the difference. That's the difference. Open source projects don't have to do destructive feature, uh, uh, feature churn because that's not where their incentives are pushing them. Because they don't have to do destructive feature churn, an auto-update strategy actually works for most users. And that's what they've settled on doing. Yes? I'm sorry, but it does fix it for me. I use a lot of plugins. Yeah. And one of them, source chart, for example, vanished for months until somebody got around to updating it. Okay, so it does happen sometimes. Um, <coughs> reality is messy. Yeah. Uh, okay, next question. We are now into the, you get to tell me what I talk about. 
And by the way, I love pet peeves. They're great launching places. So if you've got a pet peeve, don't hold it in. Looking? Looking? No yeah. I don't have a pet peeve. I want to know how you spell fresh beef. Oh. <laughs> in the obvious way. Meat as in flesh. Yes. And not meat as in... Yes, it's, it's fresh meat as in, as in, as in fruit that hasn't rotted yet. <laughs> yes. And it is fresh. Yes. Not flesh. Not flesh. <laughs> That's a completely different kind of sight. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, that sounds like the kind of sight where they ask you where you're 18. Where you're 18 <laughs> I've never seen that. What are, where would you say <laughs> Okay, <laughs> everybody wants to be a comedian, yeah. fortunately. So you're the one standing up. Uh, I'm not sure whether you know the correct or not, but on the internet, I saw from the website, uh, you mentioned that. Uh, I said this one. What happened was they were, uh, they had some kind of, um, they had some kind of boiler room set up with a recruiting agency where um, reps from the recruiting agency were sending out um, mass emailings for low-level tech support positions. And one of them sent me one, and I sent it back a snarky letter. <laughs> the, uh, the phrase, um, hell will freeze over so hard that sulfur will become cryogenic, was, was included, I believe. <laughs> uh, OK, next. I'd like to hear your opinion about Android, which is half open source, half commercial, um, and and. Is it really open source enough? Can it succeed? OK, you like it, I see. <laughs> he pulls out his cell phone and says, I have an Android. I love my Android. Um, yes, it would be nice if some of the minor closed source adhesions in the system were removed. Um, yes, it would be nice if it were um, running something like a real Linux distribution rather than Java on a, on a weird, non-standard Java runtime. But these are details. Um, it's a good device. I find it extremely functional. I find it configurable enough for my purposes. Um, I think that the extent to which it remains closed source doesn't really bother me because it is, it is clearly leading a trend towards even more open source in that space. And I'm not just hand waving here. I'm thinking of the Memo. I'm, here, I'm thinking of the Nokia Memo, which has just come out which is even more open. It can run an only slightly modified Debian distribution. Um, and I think um, what, um, I think Android, for all the minor imperfections that it has from the point of view of an open source purist, was a tipping point. And from here onwards in that space, it's all good. So I'm happy with it. So do you log into a shell and do stuff? No. No, it's interesting. One of the things that I, uh, I, I liked about the Android was that I knew that I could get an SSH app that it will, would allow me to log into my system from my cell phone. Uh, and I have it, and I think it's really cool that I have it, and someday it's probably going to save my butt in some odd situation, but I haven't actually used it yet. What I'm more worried about is it seems very strongly controlled by a single company. Yeah. Right? And I am not actually convinced that if someone decided to fork it, that Google will allow it? Um, well, I'm not really worried about that because if, if Google decides to be assholes about that, there's the Memo code base. Or there's uh, OpenMoco, or there's half a dozen efforts pointing in a similar direction. Um, the, what, what Google has done, which it cannot undo, it, is, it has created a precedent that says, Yes, you can have a, qual a high quality cell phone, a high quality consumer device that people will buy in large numbers that is open source. They can't take back that precedent no matter what they do about the specific code base. For, so from the strategic point of view, from the view from 30,000 feet point of view, it's all good regardless of what they try to do in the future. Um, one of the things I'm, I'm actually tremendously heartened by is um, they're finally putting out Android for multiple phones, and that's going to in, that's going to increase the competitive pressure 
on the phone makers, and it's going to increase the pressure on Google, too, in some interesting and subtle ways. So, yeah, and the thing is, it's really easy to look at developments like that and say, it isn't, you know, 1,000% free software, blah, 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 and get, all, all, get upset about all these little marginal edge cases. Relax. Relax. Victory is important. Purity is not important. Victory is important. Learn to be a graceful winner. That's also part of coping with success. Yes? Hi, I'm actually, I'm glad you are here. And uh, my dissertation actually is about open source. And I cite your work, which is a casual and bizarre, actually, my dissertation. Excuse me while I do a comedy bit. Oh, everybody does. <laughs> <laughs> yes? And actually, um, I'm looking at source board. And I actually collect data from source board dot net. And I want to actually uh, get your feedback or suggestion. Basically, I'm looking at a whole, a whole of what factors impact the final uh, software project performance. Oh, software boy. performance basically look at files or you know, the downloads, those things. Find me afterwards and quiz me. That's not something I can cover here and now. Okay. <laughs> you sound like you've got much more in-depth questions than I can, I can answer on stage of the talk. Okay. Eric, and you'll be around today? Well, I wasn't planning on leaving after the talk, so... <laughs> Yeah, I will be around. I'm, I, I believe in the, I'm going to be here for a banquet tonight. So, yes. Um, do you think uh, you know? So the open source revolution has succeeded. Do you think things like Gmail, and Google Docs, and these Web 2.0 applications are a threat? I have mixed feelings about that sort of thing. Um, on the one hand, um, they're really convenient, and they're sure as hell better than having the world be dominated by Microsoft Office. Uh, on the other hand, I'm uneasy about having critical data that my life depends on, on somebody else's servers, and I don't have instant access to it, which is why I am very heartened by the existence of the Data Liberation Front. Anybody heard, of, anybody heard about this? There is now a group of engineers at Google, which is officially from Google, from the highest levels at Google, has the following challenge. Make all of the data in all of our products exportable, push button. Okay? They have a blog. The blog is called Data Liberation Front. I love it. <laughs> um, so that, to me, is an indication that the... Uh, that the, uh, the things are heading in the right direction. It's exactly the parallel case to my issue with Berlioz. My dependency on Berlioz what became a problem because I couldn't get the data out. I couldn't make instant backups. I couldn't replicate that stuff and move it somewhere else. If my cloud <coughs> provider, whether it's Google or somebody else, has those instant uh, export mechanisms and they actually work, then that enables me to do risk management and suddenly using them becomes a great deal more attractive. That is, by the way, true for Google Docs. That you can already pull all that stuff out? Yeah. yeah. Okay. With, uh, and it's basically one click. Cool. Two clicks. What do you get out? Some kind of XML thing? Uh, you get to choose the format by document type. Oh, right. I read, I read about this. They'll give you, uh, they'll, well, for my purposes, the most interesting format you can get things out in is probably open office because, well, that's transparent all the way down. Um, PDFs are right only. Uh, okay, next. Um, is, can you comment if there's a similarity between um, the, um, what you just said about the uh, data liberation and the uh, revolution within the Industrial Revolution of interchangeable parts? Ooh. Wow, thank you. Day's most thought-provoking question <laughs> so far. Unintentional. <laughs> Uh, let me think about that for a moment. Um, yeah, sure. In that um, suddenly, okay, yeah, I think, I think that's a good analogy. That's a really strong analogy. Uh, what he's talking about is that back at the beginning of what we would now consider precision uh, machining, parts for things like muskets had to be handcrafted and hand fitted into the assembly that they were destined for. Um, everybody thinks mass production was invented by, by uh, by Henry Ford, but no, actually it wasn't. It was originally invented for producing weapons in the early 1800s. The very first mass production process was, 
uh, in, in modern times were from, from muskets. You can actually find earlier historical precedents. Notably, there was a shipyard in, in, uh, in Venice called the Arsenal that applied mass producing methods to production methods to making galleys as far back as the 1600s. But that's fusty old history that you're not interested in. What, he, what he's talking about is, there, yeah, there is an analogy here between the effects of making progress, projects easily migratable between forges and the effects of interchangeable parts manufactured, manufactured to spec, which meant suddenly your dependence on one single industrial supplier was severed. You could use parts from anybody that could machine to specified, spe, uh, to specified tolerances. Very good thinking. Thank you for bringing that up. Next. Uh, are you familiar with Drupal.org and do you have any comments on it? Drupal, the, uh, the content management system? Yes. Um, the open source initiative uses it for their, uh, their, their central site and their blog and their news announcements. So I've actually used Drupal myself a little bit, but I don't know, I don't know very much about it. I mean, I don't, I don't know enough to uh, have formed strong opinions or anything. Why do you ask? Um, I teach a course where we uh, do web design, and one of the clients, the community clients, they're working on a web design for Um, it doesn't suck. <coughs> well, it, it's, it's worth learning. It doesn't suck. I mean, I don't know if it's the best thing out there, but it works. Um, I do have an entire separate rant about it. I know how to public speak. What was that? Or controversial. Controversial. Uh, oh, okay. Let's try for controversial. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, the, the thought I'll leave you with is something that I actually learned before, uh, long before open source. <clears throat> um, uh, I, in a former life, uh, I learned uh, various kinds of um, lay therapy associated with psychology and various new age therapeutic methods. A lot of it was bullshit, some of it was useful. Uh, and back then I had to grapple with the question of, these techniques give me a lot of people, uh, a lot of power to intervene in people's lives and the way people's minds work. How do I know what a good use is? And I struggled with the ethics of that sort of thing for a while. And then I don't remember whether I thought this up or someone else suggested it to me, but it's a guideline I've, I've used ever since. And it's one that's applicable to thinking about software design as, uh, as well. You know you are doing the right thing when the effect of your actions is to increase the range of choices that people have. You are doing well if you are not narrowing their choices. And that's the thought I'd like to leave you with. Thank you.